So here we are at the Stinson block. We're standing between the Reginas you can see here on the right. And these are sweet, or excuse me, these are Skeena on the left hand side. And I just wanted to show you something that I that I really like um, about what I see here on this block, and that is the amount <coughs> of shoot extension that we continue to see, um, even though we are uh, getting going uh, into the growing season, um, fairly well into the growing season. Um, what I what I like to see is you can see in the trees here all of the light green. Um, light green shoots that are or light green colored leaves on the tips on these actively growing shoots um, and then you see the darker green behind them to me those uh, to me those indicate really healthy trees because the trees are growing like gangbusters and those new leaves are before they expand are a little lighter in color and you can see as we look up the up this driveway here um, you can see that we have lots of new shoot extension. In my opinion, cherry trees need to be growing throughout uh, the time when they have fruit up until harvest um, and maybe even later. Uh, because if a cherry tree stops, stops producing these shoots um, and the crop hasn't yet been harvested, the fruit tend to stop sizing. And so we like to see here on our place these shoots continuing to grow right up through harvest so that we are actually picking in blocks where the shoots are still growing. If they aren't, then we see smaller fruit. So a couple of observations here. Uh, the number of Regina that you see here on these trees is a really, really big crop for I shouldn't say a really big crop. Uh, it's really, really big crop, but it's a very big crop uh, compared to average for Regina. Um, our average Regina crop is probably around the um, three ton or so level per uh, per acre, and the crop that we see here. Uh, we're probably looking at, um, I would say, between 6 and 8 tons per, per acre here. Uh, it's very unusual to have this large of a Regina crop. And uh, that's something that has probably to do with pollination. These trees generally bloom very heavy. This Regina variety generally blooms very heavy. Um, but not very many of the blossoms set and then the blossoms that do set we get a very heavy june drop which means that the cherries begin to grow and they grow for say a month or so and then they fall down onto the ground and uh, we can look down here and you can see a couple of uh, little red cherries uh, like this um, that's very typical of uh, june drop cherries and in a normal Regina crop, you'd see a lot of those, a lot of those on the ground. And so um, that's, uh, that's something that I've been really impressed of. Uh, the AEA program uh, is the crop set that we have here so far. Let's look a little bit here at just at this tree. You can see this bottom branch, it's a little bit more shaded. And you see how the shoots aren't uh aren't extending anymore this this shoot here that came out this year that stopped growing and it's lost that uh it's lost that nice light green color and then we look up here and you see these shoots are still actively growing they have this uh they have this light green color here and um so that's a quick way that even from across the hillside you can look over at a block and you can see uh, what the block uh, looks like and judge um, quickly at least one one consideration is how many green shoot uh, those light green shoots it has you can judge it from afar and so when I walk into a block that's the first thing that I look at at any orchard anywhere in the world that I'm visiting but this is uh, <coughs> excuse me this is one heck of a Regina crop in here and I'm really pleased let's look over here at the Skeenas the Skeena 
Skeena is typically a cherry that uh, sets a sets a very heavy crop. Um, it uh, has the potential to produce really large crops, far larger than Regina normally. But one of the challenges that Skeena has is the uh, clustering of fruit in big clusters where um, they form such a tight cluster it's actually difficult to pick. And so you'd see a you'd see a group of fruit like this, but they'd be packed in there really tight. And that generally is because at the base of one year wood, you have um, uh, uh, you have really a, a lot of fruit buds and and no spur buds forming. Um, and then that's also what leads to blind wood, where uh, at the base of one year old shoots, you grow a piece of fruit, you pick it off, and then there's nothing nothing growing there anymore. Um, I would uh, I would like to see more fruit on these on these skeena, um, but we're down here at the very bottom of the orchard um, where I think we received a bit more uh, cold during the November freeze, and uh, it appears to be affecting these skeena more than the uh, more than the regina the freeze. But one thing I do like is we don't see any of those really tight clusters of of fruit in these skeena here. Uh, we see a well uh, distributed, um, real distributed amount of fruit, and that makes picking very efficient. It also makes uh, the fruit be exposed to more air and more sun, so more air movement and more sun, which is uh, very important in uh, preventing powdery mildew from developing inside those tight clusters. Those tight clusters of fruit, uh, this is more of a clustered area, but it's still not bad. Um, within that tight uh, cluster like this, if it's really big, the inside of the cluster has a microclimate that uh, powdery mildew really likes to, uh, to develop in. It could also be that the nutrition um, status of tight clusters, of fruit within tight clusters, because you have a lot of fruit in one area competing with a limited amount of vascular tissue, um, it could be that those fruit are maybe perhaps more naturally uh, or naturally more susceptible to mildew because they don't have the amount of nutrition they need. But um, again, I'm really pleased with uh, really pleased with how these, uh, particular with how these Regina look. We'll just walk up the up the hill more, get a little bit out of the frost area, and uh, I mean a tree like this. If if we had every tree in the block looking like this. Uh, this is definitely perhaps a 10 ton uh, an acre tree right here where uh, we have a large, large amount of fruit. <laughs> the other thing that we have is we appear to have really shut down um, bacterial canker in this block, uh, Pseudomonas, and that is really, really a great thing. Um, we look in these trees here and we just don't see any bacterial canker uh, at this time at all and normally we would we would be finding bacterial canker in fairly large amounts in here another thing that's really impressive is as we look at the crop set of these trees uh, which is substantial um, <clears throat> if you actually get into the <coughs> excuse me if you actually get into the tree and you take a look uh, you can see um, where I'm showing you uh, where my fingers are here, there's actually a lot of, of dead spurs in these trees um, that was that were caused by the, the winter freeze. So if we look in here, you can see along these branches, uh, you can actually see dead, uh, dead spurs, but um, the level of uh, dead spur damage is limited in this block relative to a neighboring block that's under my uh, standard management system and that was covered in a video that Gary took out here um, a month or so ago but uh, I, I'm really impressed because if we didn't have that number of spurs being damaged in here uh, the crop would be even larger so um, uh, I'm excited to see what next year's crop is and we want to keep doing a really good job with our nutrition program like what we've been doing in here to uh to keep things uh to keep things going 
and I think our crop potential for next year is going to be really substantial, especially when you think that Regina is a variety that likes to set fruit at the base of one year wood, and so all of these new shoots that are growing are going to be setting uh, fruit um, at the base of them, and that is fruit that is of particularly desirable quality because it's larger and firmer than the rest of fruit uh, in the trees typically. But uh, here we just have a heck of a crop. Um, these cherries um, will be picked probably, uh, I'm going to guess, around June 25th, 26th, somewhere around there. Although it depends on the climate that the good Lord provides for us here. Uh, but I'm really impressed with the color of the leaves and also with the, the size of the leaves. Here's a... Here's a leaf at the base of a, of a shoot, um, and uh, we just have great looking leaves here in this block. And I want to remind everyone that when we started here, I'll pick a leaf here. Uh, the leaf I'm holding in my hand, this was, this was a, an average leaf size in the block when we started this work. And then now look at what our leaf size is. Really good work, everybody on our team that's been uh, helping get this block going. Uh, really impressive, and uh, I'm uh, very pleased. So anywhere, anywhere, that's uh, just a quick view, quick snapshot of the Skeena and Regina. We'll go look at the um, Sweethearts here in a minute. So here we are looking at our uh, Sweetheart trees. Again, you see these really, really nice um, green shoots growing. And uh, I'm very pleased with the amount of shoot extension that we have in this orchard. Um, I like to grow a lot of canopy, especially on Sweetheart and Skeena trees, uh, because they are particularly susceptible to the heat that we have um, in the late summer or in the later part of harvest, uh, generally in the late July and early August timing, we get very hot, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and with 25 mile per hour winds. And as I've mentioned in other videos, we need to have a lot of canopy around these cherries to protect them from the beating sun and protect them from the wind. And uh, so when we have shoot extension like this, I'm really pleased. The other thing that's really important is we want to have uh, we want to have shoots evenly throughout the top and bottom of the trees pushing. Trees that don't have enough energy in them only push shoots at the top, like you see um, like you see right here. But if we look down the tree, we also see shoots distributed throughout the throughout the entire uh, bottom part of the tree. And the other thing is, trees that don't have enough energy will only push shoots on the outside of the tree. And if we look into this tree here, um, you can see like these new shoots here are also on the inside of the tree. And uh, I just got a nice whiff of sea shield there. It's the, the smell of money as I tell the guys. But um, we, w this tree is a really good example of the, of the trees in this block where we just have a tremendous amount of energy in these trees. And if we want to accomplish the, uh, if we want to accomplish our goal, which is to increase the quality of our fruit in here with size and firmness, but also we want to produce the maximum yield potential as well here. That's, a, that's a, my second goal after fruit size and firmness is I want to increase the amount that we're producing here. Um, we have to grow more canopy and we have to have a lot of energy in the tree because I really want to rope um, like the Regina trees we're looking at here. I want to, ro we call it rope the fruit on to these, uh, to these sweetheart trees. Now the sweethearts are, this is a fairly light crop for sweethearts. Um, they typically have a eight to 10 uh, ton yield, um, but uh, they are also a variety, the sweetheart that is particularly susceptible to cold damage. And uh, so that's something that we 
um, something that we've seen is that the sweethearts uh, just um, took the cold um, harder than other varieties. Let's look really quickly here at one of the challenges that we're seeing this year and it's probably because of the amount of uh, ammonia uh, that we have in the leaves but it's definitely a nutritional issue. Um, if we look here at these leaves that are curled um, this is black cherry aphid and it's a very typical situation so you can see throughout this tree um, sorry about the backlight there but throughout this tree we have um, leaves that are that are curled um, curled like these leaves here um, this is black cherry aphid they like to grow on the tips of um, vigorously growing shoots generally is where you find them and uh, we have a, a colony of black cherry aphid here and if we uncurl the leaf here you can see all of these uh, black aphids um, growing along the leaf and that glossiness that you see is the honeydew that these aphids are secreting. Um, these aphids are a real challenge uh, because they attack the growing tips of shoots and they reproduce um, quite rapidly. I don't see any sign that these are slowing down and uh, what happens is this one-year-old shoot here that's our future uh, that's our future um, crops um, for many years right here growing on this shoot and when it curls the shoot will stop growing and and uh, it actually can die back and uh, we don't want that so um, if we look here we can see these black cherry aphids are um, are throughout this tree and um, uh, that's something that I've noticed uh, um, this year that I haven't noticed in the past is that we seem to have more black cherry aphid. It could be just the um, it could be just the year, but um, aphids. Uh, when I listen to John Kemp speak, are one of the first things that we should see disappear when we have everything right. And so, my feeling is that we don't have everything right here yet. I'm going to pull this uh, branch down so we can take a look. So I've just grabbed this branch that was backlit um, um, and you can see all of the black cherry aphid here. So this is the whole one year old shoot um, and uh, we, look in, we look in here and we see all of these black cherry aphids and all of the honeydew. Um, interestingly enough those yellow eggs are ladybird beetle eggs and we love to see that. Um, unfortunately with our current um, status of managing spotted wing drosophila um, we're applying sprays that will probably um, kill those ladybird larvae. Um, the white uh, the white that you see in uh, uh, in this uh, bottom uh, or the cent center leaf now I'm trying to turn it there's also some syrphid fly eggs in there and so our natural enemies are getting going on these uh, on these aphids, but we want to uh, we want to have the tree itself uh, be be um, providing its own defense for the aphids. Uh, so I'm just I picked this branch because you can see that all of the terminal growth here is covered by aphids, and this branch uh, this sh uh, shoot will be shut down completely and will quit growing and as I mentioned that's uh, that's not a good thing so a couple of things I think we need to get our our ammonia under control that's nitrogen floating around in these in these uh, branches um, we really need to figure out a way to get that uh, ammonium down because it's it's pretty high and uh, I suspect that that's the source of nitrogen these these uh, aphids are eating could be wrong, I don't know that for sure, but uh, they have to be eating some kind of nitrogen that's available in there, and the ammonium sure, certainly is high on our on our sap analysis for, for all blocks. So that's uh, one of our challenges. The other thing is that when we get our fruit um, resistant to spotted wing drosophila attacks, we will uh, be able to um, have these natural enemies. If there are uh, trees that are have an imbalance, 
um, will be have the natural enemies be able to uh, really hammer these aphids because the aphids are the cattle of the insect world. Everything eats them and everything likes them. Uh, so they're they're quite tasty. Anyhow, I'm going to set this uh, set this branch back in here um, in the canopy so that we uh, those uh, ladybird beetle eggs can hatch and and have access to the canopy. So uh, that's my report for for today. Thank you very much.